What sort of tools do you need to build the Starship Enterprise? On Monster Hobbies, let's build it! Hello everybody, my name is Trevor Slescu and I'm the owner of Monster Hobbies in High River, Alberta, Canada. I put this shirt on just so I could do this, so you would know our store. Ha <laughs> ha! But anyway, welcome to our first in this special series of Let's Build It, where we are going to build the 1983 Star Trek Enterprise kit. Now, just so you know, I'm a bit of an expert and a fan of this kit. I've built many since that time. And in fact, this is one of the first ones that I actually built using that kit. Uh, I put my own decals on for the numbers. They're kind of more like the motion picture in a way. But I was trying to make sort of an ultimate enterprise at the time. But uh, it wasn't quite my best job, you know, compared to later years when I got more experience with it. And this kit has kind of not held up. The stickers here don't come with the kit. I created them myself, actually. But this one has seemed to have slipped out of position. Which is really odd. These yellow or red triangles came from a World War II airplane. <laughs> but anyway, yeah, you can see, though, that despite the age of this, it's held up pretty well. So, before we actually build our own version of this, a new one, using... Well, I'm going to use the 1983 kit. But before we do that, I'll just put this over here. We need to know what kind of tools we need for this project. So this little video, it's going to be short, is going to show you the tools that you will need. And I'm going to show you how to convert an existing household item into a special type of tool for this kit. So let's go down to our workbench here. I'm filming in my basement because it's nice and convenient. Let's go down to the bench and take a look at our tools. So the first thing you want to do is have a nice little area with a good wooden table, a nice comfortable chair, a TV, some music, and a VCR, DVD, Blu-ray combination, whatever you want there, so that you have a nice, comfortable, relaxing area to work in. The other thing you want to do is make sure that this area is well ventilated because you will be using glues and paints. The next thing you want to do is have a cutting board. And this is a piece of shelf that I actually had cut off. Uh, but it's a nice hard press board. I guess this is MDF. Makes a good cutting surface. And uh, that's one of the key elements you need in your hobby area so that you can cut your parts on it. So one of the first tools you're going to actually need for building any model are these clamps. And because these are really handy to get in tight areas around your model and to hold pieces together. Now you may be wondering, well, where do I get these special clamps? I've never seen this before. Well, if any of you have actually done laundry, you have seen these before. This is your standard clothes peg. Now I'm going to show you a trick on these. It's very simple. You just pull them into their three components. The spring and the two halves. And then if you look at one of the halves, you'll notice that there's a notch here, a notch there, and a notch there. And then this is where the spring was clipped to from the outside. Well, what we're going to do is we're going to take this spring and put it there instead. Then you need to bend the little arm and put it in that first notch right there. Then take your second piece, or your third piece, I guess, and force the little spring end up and slide that right into there. So basically you've taken your clothes peg and inverted the actual wood pieces. And there you have a nice little clamp. Probably doesn't work so well on my finger. There you go. Hello! <laughs> now the thing is, you're going to need a bunch of them. So I suggest going down to like a dollar store or, you know, asking your parents if you can take their clothes pegs. And just spend some time 
inverting all these things and making as many of them as you can make. And now uh, over the years I've made a ton of these. And different clothes pegs will actually give you different distances. I don't know if they make them with this big spring anymore. This is going back like generations ago. But you can easily see, you know, that the older, bigger spring gives you an extra couple of millimeters between the blades. I guess blades. Yeah, so there is your free tool of the day. These ones are fairly big and scary looking. And they've got a super spring in them, like, yeah, like really tough. However, on your Starship kit, I'm when we get into building it, I'm going to show you where these clamps are really handy. Actually, these clamps, I can tell you, are really handy for painting and holding items when you paint. And you can use them in conjunction with these ones. What I do is I put them here as a foot and then wedge or wiggle this around. And then if I've got a big part that I need to paint, like, let's say, a warp engine or something, you can hold it like that and then spray paint it. And this thing won't let go, right? So the next thing you're going to need is some hobby glue. And what model, what modeling session is not complete without some hobby glue? So this is the old standby tried and true testers tube glue. As you can tell, I've used this one quite a bit because a new one would be nice and fresh and in a package like that. And this one comes with some little tip ends. So you would take the cap off and then you can put one of those ends on there and it gives you like a better flow than that. More control. Yeah, there we go. <laughs> trying to do that around the camera end. Now this is plastic cement from Testers. Unfortunately, this bottle I've used up. So I'm going to have to order more. But this one has a nice brush. And when you're doing those long lines down your warp engines and around your, your primary hull, you want, and the, the two parts are long and they're together, you want to take the brush with the glue on it and go right down those lines. And the liquid glue will run in between the two pieces and glue your kit together. And now this is liquid glue from the Games Workshop, which I will probably be using, there you go, with the La Francais plastic glue for 16 years and up. But hey, when I was a kid, I was eight and I was using this because now I'm a man. No, anyway. <laughs> okay. Joking aside, uh, this is a good liquid glue as well. You can hear it going. And if you watched any of my Games Workshop videos, you'll see that I use it quite a bit. This one has a metal straw in it that allows a really fine application along the glue seam lines. And what's nice is if this straw jams with glue, you simply take it out and turn it over. I'm having a hard time lining this up because I'm not actually directly looking at it. I'm looking at the view screen of the camera. But yeah, it's it's a good glue for that. So if it jams, you know, as you're gluing along, just flip this over, put it back in. And I find that nine times out of ten, it will clear up that jam. And then, of course, don't forget to put your cap on it whenever you put your glues away so they don't dry out. And there you go. On to the next tool. The next set of tools we'll be examining are your hobby knives. And these come from a variety of different companies. Like this one here, I believe is an old Exacto. This one is an Excel knife and it has a knurled hand grip here with the Excel logo in it. So you can get some control when you cut. <laughs> this one doesn't have any type of grip. It's pretty smooth. But these these knives actually have a universal thing, which I'll show you in a minute. This is another type of knife, a little more deluxe. It comes with a safety cap, which is handy so you don't stab yourself in your hobby toolbox. I see I got a shadow there. <laughs> uh, now, I'll get back to this one in a minute. 
I better look here. Okay. So these two knives have a similar thing. Uh, this is a number 11 blade, and this is a number 16 blade. And as you can tell, one is angular and the other one is sort of truncated angular. This is a good knife here to push down and clip parts off of your part tree. This is a good knife for scraping along edges like, like that sort of thing. Now, the universal thing they have is how the blades come out so you can replace them. You simply unscrew here until you get a bit of gap there and then you push this collar down. The collar will release your blade. Then you can replace it with a new blade. See that that X shape there? What the collar does is it forces this together under pressure. So you put your knife blade back in there and then you're going to turn and keep turning until you can't turn anymore and now your blade is locked. Now this knife, this knife, that is on the end of this handle. So what you would do here is turn it this way, then you can pull it out and see it's also got that X there and replace the blade with a new one. And you simply put it back into the top right there and then tighten your bottom again oh my and uh there that will lock your blade into place and if you're really young always remember to have parental supervision when you're dealing with knives now our next set of tools that we like to use here are these files and they come in a variety of shapes and sizes from these ones and there's smaller ones of these yet this is a set of files rather small and you can take them out of the package this set of files has different types of designs some are circular some are triangular some are triangular with a point um, some are wide some are narrow as you can see here, this is an old King set. I don't know if they still make them, but there's 10 of them in there, 140 millimeters long. Sometimes you can find these in dollar stores. Now these ones, I'm not sure where they came from, but they they have a rough surface in here. And these are good for uh, uh, like filing out big things. This is a circular one, this is a half round, and this one is a flat file. Uh, as you can tell, I've used these quite a bit. Files usually work on the push stroke, not the pull stroke, because the metal teeth are all shaped facing like that, like a staircase forward. So on the push stroke, you're going to do your most um, ripping or filing on these. Now this set here is the same, almost the same shapes. This is the one I use the most because it's a nice agile blade, very thin. These ones are finer than these coarse ones that I have. You also want to look on some of these files because they will have a smooth side on one end and on this thin blade end and of course end on the other side which means you can take your file this way instead of this way and here we have this is a really fine file a flat one and of course a half round really super fine so you will find spots on your models where you will need these and as we go along the build I will show you where now our next set of tools are designed to make holes. These are drills, which are here, and hole enlargers. These are special tools. I believe my dad made these. They're pretty old. <clears throat> he didn't make the drills though. <laughs> now this one is a cool drill. This is a Zona drill, and I have a couple of these in the store. Monster Hobbies in High River, Alberta, Canada. What I like about these is, okay, to put the drill in, it's got a very little drill chuck right here. 
and you can just unwind them. This one, come, uh, it doesn't come with these drills, but these drills you use in this drill. These drill bits, drill bits. There's 80 of these things. I've lost a bunch. Uh, I might need a new one of these sets. But here's a little drill here. A drill bit. So you, much like the hobby knife, you just unwind the chuck. Oh, put that in the end and wind the chuck back down. And there your drill is ready to go. But what's nice about this drill, you see the spring along here? And I don't know if you can see that. It's sort of got a twist. You, This cap at the end is free spinning. And this slides. And as it slides, it twists the drill. So you can hold it on the back here like this. And then move this down. And you see it's now drilling into my table, which is not what you want to do, but... <laughs> for the purposes of this demonstration, that's how this works. So it's like a miniature version of a power drill. Now our other drill is this one. This is a 1 16th drill bit on the end. Uh, now this is a cool one because this one you can have multiple drills in it. Multiple drill bits, I should say because this cap comes off and this one see it's still got that cross in there but it's got a hole right you can turn this one over you notice that that hole is larger than that one so if you had a bigger than 1 16th drill you can turn this around this way and then you just turn that up till it stops and then, in the handle here, you got another one for medium range and really small range drills. So this one is quite a universal piece. The only fault I find with this is sometimes when you're drilling, this stuff will unwind because the thread's in the wrong direction of the way you're turning the drill, which, I don't know, kind of their own fault. But if you need a drill, you need a drill, right? And much like the hobby knife, you just wind down until you can't wind anymore and then everything is locked in super tight. And then... Ooh. Okay, these hole enlargers... My dad made them. Now, I don't know if you, I don't think you can see it on the little one. You can see it better on the big one. It's actually flat, been hammered flat, and a bit wide at the point. And the idea here is if you drilled a hole, okay, and you're trying to put a piece of plastic in the hole, sometimes the plastic is not quite 100% circular, right? So you use the hole enlarger in the hole and you, you know, you twist it in and it will enlarge the hole a little bit and make it more of a not perfectly circular shape so that you could put that plastic piece in there and it would hold it better. The next set of tools that I like to use are these side cutters. These ones originally had a spring in here. I don't know if you can see this. There's a hole right there and on the other side, but one day I was using it and it went a little too wide and the spring popped out. But at any rate, these are great for your parts trees in your model. You can get up between the part and the tree and just snip and off it comes. You can usually find a package of these at a dollar store again, or a good hobby shop like mine. Um, for relatively cheap. Sometimes you'll find them in a pack of five with other different types of pliers and and that sort of thing. And along with cutting, you can also find yourself one of these Atlas Super Saws. These are really handy to use because uh, with your side cutters, you can only get in certain areas. 
and this tends to cut something and leave like a wedgy point on it, much like our clamps. If you don't want that kind of point, because you're going to have to file it down, the Atlas Super Saw is really handy because you can actually take and like cut the part dead square or you know at an angle, whatever you want to, however you want to cut it for your purposes. Here's another good tool to get. A pair of hobby scissors. You can also get these as uh, like surgical scissors or whatever out of a, I don't know, mustache trimming set or fingernail clipper set. But these you will find you can use for your decals to cut them apart off the decal sheet. And for our next little tool, sandpaper cutting sandpaper across. Now this is a sanding block and this is made out of MDF hardwood nice and hard and it keeps that flat 100% perfect flat surface. Now you're wondering well how did you get the sandpaper on there? Well this is what I use. This is an automotive sandpaper now this stuff is rough. It's 180 grit, but it's got the sticky back. And the reason why it's circular is so that you can use it on a circular sander. You can get this at an automotive shop. It's a bit expensive, but you get a ton of this and I've had this for 13 years and I still haven't gotten all the way through all the little discs on here. And I've even used this on my car and I still haven't gotten through all the discs on here. What's nice about it is you can stick it right on. You can stick it right on there and then cut around with your little scissors here and cut it perfectly to that square block. And as you can see, if it gets worn out, you can just, if I had my fingernails still, you can just get in here and peel it right off your block. Now on the other side, this is fine sandpaper, again from the automotive or hardware store, but I've used double-sided white tape that you can find for putting down carpet. And that is what's underneath here is the sticker holding it onto the thing, to the block. Now sandpaper is another topic we got here. Now here's a whole bunch of sandpaper. Um, before you guys build a model, you should know that there are some sandpapers which are good and some sandpapers that will totally destroy your model. This is one of them. You only want to use this on wood because this is 60 grit and this is like uh, super, super rough. This stuff here is finer. It's 150 grade. And you might think, oh, well, that would be good to use. But 150 grade is still too harsh for plastics. It'll leave permanent scratches in there. I'm even taking a risk using my 180 on that. Where they say to really start is about 220 grade. That's the uh, the roughest that plastic should be taking. This is 320. Now the P uh, means that you can use it wet or dry. I think the P means that anyway. <laughs> uh, you get five sheets in this. It's from 3M. I got this at the hardware store. There is P320. After you sand your kit or whatever you, you want to do, you want to sand it again with P400. What happens is when you s use sandpaper, you're making scratch lines in the plastic, right? So if you start with the 320, that's a rough one for plastic, and you're taking out the rough stuff, then you come across with the P400. Now you're, f you're refining the scratches from the P320. Once you're done that, you're going to use the ultra-fine 600 grit. And all these sandpapers have whatever grit it is on the back. 
600. And these are all wet dry sandpaper. So you can get the sandpaper wet and use it on your model or you can use it dry. After 600, I suggest going to 800. After 800, you go to 1000 grade. After 1000, you're going up to 1200. And after 1200, you want to go to 1500 grit. And that means cutting up a bunch of pieces of sandpaper and gluing them to your block. Or you can freehand it with your fingers. It depends on the application. And when we build these models, I'll show you where and what I'm going to use for the sanding. Another item that you will find really, really handy when you build this model kit are these pieces of evergreen scale models, sheet styrene plastic, and rods and other pieces. What we are going to do is use these pieces to reinforce our model kit to make it a bit stronger. And if you can't find evergreen, try looking under Plastruct. They also have sheets of plastic, different types, and also textures like this uh, Spanish roof tile, which will come in really, really handy for reinforcing your model. Maybe not the Spanish roof tile, but you know, the regular sheets. And last but not least, we have our putties. Unfortunately, I ran out of this stuff, but this is one that I really like. This is the Tamiya Gray Putty. I like it so much that I used down every millimeter of it. <laughs> ah, Tamiya Putty. Um, now this is for filling deeper holes. You can also get automotive putty, the red stuff. Um, up here in Canada, you can get that at Canadian Tire. And uh, if you don't want to use, this is more of a chemical one, which will melt the plastic a little bit and bond into it. If you don't want to use chemicals, you can get this stuff. This is liquid green stuff from the Games Workshop, if there's like a Warhammer store around. This is an acrylic based putty. It will dry in and stick on the model, and you can actually sand this stuff afterwards like a normal putty. And finally, I've had this for a few years. This is Mr. Surfacer 1000. I'm not sure if I'm going to use it on this kit or not, but it is a good product. And it will fix minor surface imperfections like little scratches and other things. So don't forget to get some putty because you are going to need it for this kit. And last but not least, we also want to include our masking tape. Now you may be wondering why you need masking tape. Uh, or you may be thinking, well, this is for painting. But actually, these tools that I'm showing you are pre-painting tools. So, this is actually handy for the windows, if you want to keep your plastic windows on your kit you can cover your windows with two layers of masking tape. This one's a narrow one, and this one, of course, is really wide, and you can get half the width of this. I just don't have any right now. Um, but you can use these to cover up your windows and other details that you do not want to sand off with your sandpaper blocks. And I'll be showing you that as we build our model. Well, we hope you enjoyed that edition of Let's Build It, where we got to see the tools we're going to need when we begin our Star Trek build of the USS Enterprise from the original series. And next week, we are actually going to open up the lid on this and take out one of the parts and put them all together. But if you want to see a sneak peek and a review of this model kit, then check out my What's in the Box on this ship right here. I also have one of the Klingon here and the Romulan ship up here. And please subscribe to us right here because every time someone subscribes it allows me to make a better video. So don't forget to check out our store at www.monster-hobbies.ca and we will see you soon.